A very warm welcome back to the Lockdown Litfest studio, where, as ever, we hope you're well, we hope you're keeping safe, uh, and we hope you're being alert. I'm delighted today to introduce Claire Mully, an award-winning author and broadcaster. Her first book, The Woman Who Saved the Children, won the Daily Mail Biographers Club Prize, and The Spy Who Loved, her second work, is now optioned by Universal Studios and led to Claire being decorated with Poland's national honour, the Bene Morito. Claire's third book, The Women Who Flew for Hitler, tells the extraordinary story of two women at the heart of Nazi Germany, whose choices put them on opposite sides of history. Claire reviews non-fiction for The Telegraph, The Spectator and History Today, and is a popular public speaker. She's given TEDx talks at Stormont, spoken at the Houses of Parliament, the Royal Albert Hall, the Imperial War Museum, and the National Army Museum. And you may have seen her on TV on things like the BBC's Rise of the Nazis and the D-Day 75 coverage, Newsnight, David Jason's Secret Service, and Adolf and Ava, Love and War. Claire, it's a great delight to be able to say a very warm welcome to the Lockdown Litfest. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you, Paul? You're looking good. You're very kind. Yes, I've got a bit of a Warwickshire town. I'm locked down in the heart of Warwickshire. You're in Essex, if that's right. I'm in Saffron Malden in Essex, yes. But being, being a writer, I guess you're used to working from home, but is this, has this proved a boon, a blessing or a, or a hindrance? Uh, I am used to working from home, but not with my three fantastic, noisy daughters. So, um, yeah, I'm having a really good time with my daughters, who otherwise wouldn't spend nearly as much time with me. So it's great, but I'm not doing as much work. We have to find the silver lining in this, uh, in this terrible cloud that hangs over us at the minute. Yeah, what I, I, I want to do, because you have a very interesting background, um, and what I want to start with is, before you started writing, if memory serves, you worked with Save the Children and with Sight Savers, working in the field of charitable donations, is that right? Yes, that's right. I spent quite a few years, about a decade, working in the voluntary sector, and absolutely loved it. Yeah. And how did that, I mean, obviously, any writer worth their salt starts off being a pretty good reader. I'm always interested in the transition that took you from being a reader to thinking, oh, actually, I've got the will to tell a story and the means by which to do so. What triggered that change in career? Uh, well, I came across, I always wanted to be a writer. And when I was young, I was dream up novels, but I turned out to be terrible at dialogue and the plotting was dreadful. And, and I started working at Save the Children, which was fantastic and very stimulating. And I came across the story of the founder of Save the Children, which was completely unknown. Uh, and she was just this inspirational woman that you wouldn't believe it. You know, she, she didn't like children very much. Um, she, had, she spoke to spirits. She wrote romantic novels and rode horses furiously around. And uh, her most important relationship was with the younger sister of John Maynard Keynes, Margaret Keynes. So she was this fantastic character. And I realised that some of the best stories out there are, are real stories. And I don't need to invent dialogue. I just need to, you know, do what I love doing, which is being very nosy, and investigate and find out what happened really and put it all down. So uh, that's what started me off. All good, t all good tools to have in the toolbox for a, for a, a wonderful biographer. Um, I mean, discovering Eglantine Jeb and finding out you know, she was arrested in Trafalgar Square, she campaigned to help the children of Britain's former enemies. For, a, for your first biography, which really set your stall out, can you talk us through how you thought, okay, where's the story in this? How do I get to know her? How, do you do, how did you do the research, I suppose is the question. Um, well, I didn't have a clue what I was doing, really. I'd never done this before. Um, but I came across a leaflet. Well, actually, I went on maternity leave with my first daughter, um, who is called Eglantine, actually, but uh, only as her middle name. So I thought it was a bit cruel as a first name these days. Um, but I was uh, uh, going on maternity leave. And I've come across Eglantine, but I didn't know very much about her. I thought this was a good time to uh, investigate. I thought I might write a little article or something. So I went down to the Save the Children archives and Save the Children was then based in an old girls' school because it was very cheap rent and the old swimming pool was the archives. So I went down there and I found this little leaflet uh, which had a photograph of, it says a starving Austrian baby, but actually it was a, a two-year-old little girl who hadn't developed properly. So she looked like a baby, she couldn't even stand. Uh, and in the top right-hand corner, it said suppressed in Eglantine's terrible handwriting with an exclamation mark showing her indignation at the continued policy of the government at the end of the First World War after the armistice to continue the economic blockade to Europe as a way of pushing through harsh peace terms or greater reparations. And I, I was just really gripped at that moment when you have history in your hands. You know, she produced this leaflet off her own back and she had... Um, 
then gone to Trafalgar Square and started pressing it in the hands of anyone. It's a traditional site of public protest where the suffragettes went down. Uh, one account has her chalking up the pavements in real suffragette style. And, uh, and the government hated it, of course, and had her arrested. And they took her away, but she, uh, she went with great dignity. But she thought this is now a real opportunity. So she insisted on co conducting her own defence at court. And uh, she knew that technically she didn't have a leg to stand on because she hadn't passed these leaflets, passed the government censors. So she focused on the moral case, giving the court reporters plenty to fill their columns with up in the gallery there. Uh, and then she was found, she was found guilty. Mm. And Sir Archibald Boggin, the Crown prosecutor, didn't spare her in his condemnation. But as soon as the court case was officially over, but while everyone was still there, including the reporters, he went up and pressed five pounds into her hands clearly saying that as far as the prosecution was concerned, she'd won the moral case. And she refused to accept this five pounds. She said, thank you, I can pay my own fine, but I'll put this five pounds to a new fund to help save the children. So that was the first ever donation to save the children. And, you know, when I was un unpicking all this, it was just, you know, the hairs went up on my arms and I knew I had this extraordinary story about this wonderful unsung British heroine that we should all know and, you know, be inspired by. Well, rather inspirationally as well, if memory serves, um, all your author royalty is from that book, go to the Save the Children Fund. Yes, that's right, they do. Uh, all the money from that book goes to Save the Children, and it's just been optioned as well. So that money's going to Save the Children as well, so I'm really pleased it's doing some practical good, and I think she'd value that as well. I'm sure she would. Option for film, option for TV, for a documentary, what's option for what? Uh, it's either TV or film, we don't know yet, but um, yes, yeah, scriptwriter's working on it at the moment, so fingers crossed for that, please. Oh, fantastic. Um, that book won the Daily Mail Biographers Club Prize, which really, as I said earlier on, Claire, really set your stall out and sort of announced you to the publishing world as, oh, this is a bio biographer to look out for. Having worked on that and done such a good job, Thank can you. you talk us through how the process works? Because now you're a biographer, you're recognised as a biographer. How do you choose your subject for your second book? How does that work? Uh I didn't really know what to do. I, I then had uh, an agent, Andrew Lowney, and uh, we were obviously chatting about this. He was keen I got on and he asked me what my interests were. And I was very interested in the history of Poland, which I'd studied as part of my first degree, um, because where they're situated geographically, of course, they have this extraordinary history going back for centuries. Um, and I'm a feminist. I wanted to write about another. There is this sort of, I'm very happy to write about men, but there is this rich seam of untold women's stories. So I thought right. it would be good to mine that a bit more. And actually my agent came up with the suggestion of Christina Scarbeck. And I actually said no, because I thought, I thought it was a bit like a blind date. He was setting me up on I wanted to find my own subject. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but I went off and did a little bit of research and digging around and came across her story. And A, it's a fantastic story, and B, it hadn't really been told um, sufficiently well, I felt. So, yeah, well, like everyone, I think I was seduced by her and her story, and um, yeah, just delighted. It felt a real privilege and an honour to work on it. Well, tell, um, tell us a little bit about it. So she's Countess Christina Scarbeck, also yeah. known as Christine Granville. She was Britain's first and longest, if memory serves, female special agent in the Second World War. Longest yeah. agent, male or female, to serve Britain. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, I wasn't aware of that. She was, is it right, she was Churchill's favourite spy? Yes, at one point he told his daughter, Sarah Oliver, um, that she was his favourite spy because um, one of the great things about her was that um, we hear all these words, don't we? When, we? when we talk about women in the resistance or female special agents, we hear how courageous they were. Um, and often you hear how beautiful they were. And uh, Christine was actually beautiful. She was a, a pre-war beauty queen. But she was so much more than that. She was really effective as well. And so um, one of her early achievements, um, she worked in three different theatres of the war, actually. She just wouldn't quit. And initially she was working between um, uh, Hungary and Nazi-occupied Poland. So she was skiing in over the mountains following the smuggling routes. Um, and she made the first contact with the Polish resistance for Britain. She was their, their intermediary. Um, and one of the things that she did was she smuggled out some microfilm taken by an independent Polish resistance group, hidden inside her leather gloves and smuggled it across the borders, um, was nearly arrested several times, managed to talk her way out. In fact, at one point when she had this um, uh, mission to bring this microfilm over, she was arrested and taken for rather brutal interrogation. And uh, she had a, a cough at the time and a fever. And she decided to make a, a strength of this apparent weakness. So she, what she did was she bit her own tongue so hard and repeatedly that it, it bled copiously. And as she coughed, it looks as if she was coughing up blood. 
and the Nazis were they, they thought that this was TB, tuberculosis. They were terrified of this disease. Um, it's carried by waterborne droplets. So, you know, basically interrogation and TB don't go together very well. So they threw her out and she managed to get away, got across other borders. I mean, she's absolutely inspirational. Uh, and eventually she got this microfilm to the British air attache in Sofia. And he got it sent. He was amazed what when he took it to a back room. He didn't know her from Adam, so he checked it first. And it, saw, it showed the massing of tanks and troops on what was then the German side of the German-Soviet border. Uh, they were allies at this point. But this was clearly to, uh, a land-based invasionary army. And so that was sent straight away to Churchill, who did get in touch with Stalin on the basis of this evidence, which he checked with his ultra sources, so that's Bletchley Park. Um, and Churchill later said to his daughter, Sarah Oliver, who was going to play Christine in a film that eventually was never made, um, he said, why do you want to play her so much? She was an actress. And she said, well, because she was such an important agent, wasn't she? And he said, yes, she was my favourite spy. So, yes. A hell of a thing. And I mean, anything that shines light on Poland's early activity and, and associations and allyship with the United Kingdom really does need a flag up. You and I have both spent time, I think, at the Special Forces Club talking to some of the extraordinary women who worked um, for SOE and the Bletchley Park, you know, of, of, from the British side. And often, I've spoken to someone back in the day where I was interviewing someone, would talk about Christine as being their sort of heroine. They were sort of aware of her, but she was also a shadowy figure. Mm. Do you, did you get a handle on what she was like as a person? Yes, I think so. I mean, I would love to go, I would love to be a fly on the wall. I'm not sure I want to meet her, but I would love to witness her. Yeah. Uh, so I, I believe that I did. I felt very involved, but obviously you have to, retain some sort of distance to be objective as well I didn't want to you know I've tried to present a woman who has faults and weaknesses as well as great strengths she's not uh, a paragon by any means at all but I feel she is a very human person and uh, yeah absolutely fantastic I adored her my mum didn't she said she had too much sex but um, there you go <laughs> there's something that interests me about your career which is you have you are not keen on on the concept of writing authorised biographies. You think it lacks, it puts you in a position where you don't get objectivity. Can you talk us through that? Uh, well, I've never, I've never had the opportunity to do so. So it's not something that I've ever turned down. But yes, I do like to be able to make my own conclusions, to conduct my own research and uh, really try to get to the bottom of things. And as I said, I don't want to um, just write books that are sycophantic in praise of someone. I think it's important to get to the real human story and to understand that character. So I do think it's good to, to be able to have some distance. Having said that, when I was writing about Eglantine, I did interview the family and they were very generous in their support and opened up all their archives. Um, and, and the same has been true with all of my biographies. You know, I, I do like to do all the contextual historiography reading as well. Of course I do, but I like to get back to the original sources. And it's wonderful, you know, I had the honour when I was researching Christina Scarbeck of interviewing um, many people who knew her, sadly. I mean, well, I don't know. As the human coast erodes, I suppose, it's, it's one of my motivations is to try and capture some of these stories before they get lost. And some of them seem quite minor little anecdotes about, I interviewed a gentleman from the Special Forces Club who had met Christina in Egypt during the war. And he remembered, uh, well, he, he said they had lunch and I said, oh, fantastic. How did it go? You know, did she smoke? What do you talk about? What do you eat? Did she drink? And he remembered some details. And I said, what happened next? And he went, oh, nothing, nothing at all. I said, oh, you not see her again? And he said, well, we had dinner. And I said, oh, right. And anything else? And he said, he said, no, no, it wasn't like that at all. He said he had a girlfriend and he loved his girlfriend. and He didn't want anything else. But Christine wanted what sometimes happens after dinner. And he said he spent the next two weeks avoiding her because she was very predatory going around the club trying to sort of pin him down. And he actually went back on active service early because he was so terrified of Christina. Um, and it seems like a, you know, a minor story, but I feel it's so telling about her character. So I love to be able to include as much of that kind of detail as I can. That's an extraordinary insight. I mean, we'll come to the third book in a minute, but while we're on this, everybody you've interviewed, everybody you've biographed, you don't get the chance to speak to them because they're no longer with us. Does, what I want to discuss is what responsibility do you feel to your subjects to try and get to the truth of them without actually being able to get their own voices in? How does that work? Biography is interesting, isn't it? It does have this sort of moral element to it. You know, what are you responsible to the feelings of their family members or survivors? Are you responsible for their reputation as it would have been recognised at the time or how we would judge them today, which may be a very different thing. Mm. You know, 
um, Eglantine Jed, her most important relationship was with another woman. That's something she wouldn't have been shouting about at the time. And when I was reading her, I, eventually her family, after I'd met them a couple of times, gave me this file of correspondence between these two women that made everything very clear. And it's a very lovely romance, actually. It's a beautiful story. Um, but it was only they entrusted me after I'd met them a couple of times, for which I will always be very grateful. And at the time, I wouldn't have wanted that. But luckily, of course, attitudes have changed. So I felt I could talk about that um, and was delighted to talk about it. And she was, you know, she was delighted to be in love with Margaret. And um, so it's wonderful to be able to bring things like that out. Um, and I would never seek to hide anything like that. But, you know, there are responsibilities, I suppose. But mine is to the truth. And it's, so that guides everything. I mean, you say you feel responsibilities, but you don't want to hide the truth. Sometimes those two are going to be mutually um, uh, incompatible. How, how does that work? How do you, what steers your decision is the question I suppose I'm, I'm asking. I haven't had that situation yet where I found the truth to be incompatible with anything else. Um, if, I, if I discovered it, my... Well, one of the real problems is that sometimes when you're in the National Archives, Perhaps things are, when you get files out, are still redacted. And I did have a couple of pages with Christine where the files were redacted. Um, and I did apply under the Freedom of Information Act and I got whole files on her that people hadn't seen before. Um, and there was nothing in there that was uh, going to be damning about her character. Um, although some people feel that, you know, she was quite, uh, she, she was a very, uh, a woman ahead of her times. And uh, originally, there was going to be a film about her, as I mentioned, and it was going to be written by Bill Stanley Moss, who wrote Ill Met by Moonlight, because he was very good friends with Christina. In fact, his eldest daughter was called Christina, and Christine was her godmother, and she's, she was a great help to me during my research. Um, so he had drafted this screenplay, um, but in the end, he couldn't get enough information because a lot of the gentlemen, many of whose lives she'd saved, refused to talk to him because they said, that the world wasn't yet ready for this incredible powerful woman if you're going to tell her story honestly you needed to talk about a woman who i mean my book's called the spy who loved because she loved um she loved adventure and adrenaline um she loved men she had many lovers and two husbands um, but above all she loved freedom and independence both for her country poland for britain who she served and for all the allies but also freedom for herself personally and that independence was absolutely core she was a real freedom fighter in every sense of the word you know that was core to her being and when she died in 1952 very prematurely um, this group of men convened a group um, they called themselves the panel to protect the reputation of Christina Scarbeck the countess um, because they felt the world wasn't ready for such a powerful woman and it would you know bring her reputation down although I must say that you know several of them were married and she had been you know, the lover of many of them. So perhaps they were worried about more than one reputation, but I think they were really working from sort of honorable intentions. Yes. And um, But now we don't have to consider that. People don't are not so judgmental against those, the, the things that were being considered so important at the time. And um, she was ahead of her time, but she fits very much into our times and speaks to us very immediately, so. Absolutely, hell of a role model. Can you talk us through just how it felt when you got word that you were going to be decorated, as I said, in the introduction with the Bene Marita, the the highest national honour that a, a poem can bestow on a civilian? Um, well, actually, I, I got the letter the day my father died. Um, oh, and, uh, it, was, it was very powerful. It, it was wonderful in a way. I wish my father could have known, um, but it was lovely to have something so positive to hear uh, at that moment. Uh, we, the rest of my family were all together, and it was a really nice thing to, to focus on at that point. Um, but of course, also, it's, I mean, it's a massive honour. I, you know, it's absolutely wonderful wearing it on my pyjamas. You know, don't get much opportunity, but it's lovely to have. So. Did you go to Poland to receive it? How did that work? Uh, no, it was at the Polish Embassy in London, and the Polish then Polish Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski uh, gave it to me. Um, the ambassador was there, and a big audience. And I was one of three recipients, and I met a wonderful woman there that day um, who was a fighter in the Warsaw Uprising. A, a, Polish female soldier and that has mm -hmm. taken my research in a whole other direction so there's all you know you never know where things are going to lead and it's been fantastic. Well this is what strikes me about the wonder how wonderful your career has been in that as you as I said having set your stall out with Eglantine and then working with uh, working on Christina Christina Christine that you've chosen your subjects incredibly carefully and uh, uh, drilled down in some fascinating 
hitherto unknown stories, which rather brings us to the women who flew for Hitler. So before we t discuss who Hannah, um, Hannah Reich and uh, Melita von Stauffenberg were, how did this story come to you? Because of course it's gold dust to find something that nobody else has ever worked on before. Uh, well, I mean, we always hear how much the Second World War story is already told, and I think it's very important that we do look at some of the untold stories in there. Often they are the women's stories. And uh, how did I come across it? I was looking at, I had considered, I used to know a woman called Mary Ellis. Um, I didn't know her particularly well, but I met her a number of times. And the last time I met her was um, at a reunion of pilots called Project Propeller. And I said, look, Mary, you, your story is so fantastic. She was a pilot for the ATA. Um, she was the classic woman that got out of an aircraft at one point and everyone said, where's the pilot? And insisted on checking the cockpit and so on. And so I said, can I write your biography? I'd really love to write your life. I said, I'd love you to, Claire, but I've just finished my memoirs. I was like, oh, no. Um, but I gave her a nice review in the spectator, I think. Anyhow, so I, I was just thinking about the female pilots and I was thinking then about another woman who's fairly undersung called Constance Babington Smith, who was uh, worked in aerial reconnaissance. And she, legend has it, that she spotted the first V1 or V2 on the testing ground at Penamunda in Germany. Yeah. Um, and it struck me that I know that on those photographs, you can see little black crosses, which are the V1s, and you can see dots, which are the heads, some of them are the heads of the pilots walking across the airfield to do the test work. And one of the pilots that flew a V1 was Hannah Reich. And I just thought, here we have two women really at the heart of the Second World War story, just on opposite sides of the war. In this case, they were just on opposite sides of a lens, a camera lens that had spotted them. And yet their story was untold. So initially I was going to write about Constance and uh, Hannah, but then researching Hannah, I came across this story that is so untold. It's, it's not been told in English at all before, um, which was the story of Melissa von Stauffenberg. I mean, most people, if you say there was a, a, a test pilot who served the Third Reich, they've heard of Hannah Wright. She appears in that wonderful film, Downfall. Um, she appears in a 60s film with Sophia Loren. I mean, not her personally, but her, her character. Um, and, and yet there is, nothing on Melissa von Stauffenberg and her story if anything is even more remarkable so I, I just couldn't believe that I had to write this one. So Hannah Reich we know tested rocket planes first woman to fly a helicopter That's and, right. and flew a manned version of the prototype cruise missile the V1 the doodlebug yep that's right fanatical Nazi so as you say most people know a little bit about Hannah and I commend this book to you to find out more Bring us to Melissa von Stauffenberg. Tell us who she was and how she got involved and how she got to fly. Well, Melissa is the perfect nemesis, really, for Hannah. I mean, yep. there, there were only two people who are two women and that neither were in the Luftwaffe. They were both civilians seconded in because women weren't allowed to, you know, sully the line of male uniforms. Um, but the... Uh, she was a brilliant aeronautical engineer. She'd learned to fly in the early 1930s or maybe slightly earlier, the, the glamorous age of flight. Um, she was flying gliders and uh, she, took her first, she actually took her first flight in 1920, very early on, um, when no other women were doing this and became very interested in aerodynamics. So she studied at the Technical University of Munich, one of the only women to do so. Though, uh, there was one woman working on sort of domestic kitchen uh, engineering stuff, but she was a, a brilliant aeronautical engineer. And she, um, she became, uh, the two of them are the only two flight captains or flug captains, and they were the only women to get the Iron Cross. Um, Hannah and Melissa both got the Iron Cross second class and Hannah got it first class, which Melissa was also nominated for and it had been approved, but unfortunately uh, events changed and she never received that uh, so-called honor. Um, so they, I thought they'd be quite similar and there'd be a real sense of sorority between the only two women in this situation. You know, they often worked in the same airfields and they were the only two female members at the uh, Berlin Aero Club, um, apart from a few secretaries and wives and so on, but under their own right. And so I thought they'd really, you know, have a, a strong connection, but they absolutely loathed one another. Um, they had completely different politics. So whereas you correctly said that Hannah Reich was a fanatical Nazi, and um, I found new private letters that she wrote to people, um, which show very clearly how deeply anti-Semitic she was as well. Um, Melita has a completely different view. She, she is fighting for Germany. She's fighting for a country that she's a very proud patriot of. Um, but she is never a, uh, a keen Nazi, um, but she, she makes a deal. I mean, both women are on this grey scale, um, and they are, 
I think Melissa, ironically, was even more helpful to the regime than Hannah because she developed the dive sites and the dive breaks for the Stuka dive bomber. Yeah which was, you know, synonymous with the Blitzkrieg, would come screaming down. And in fact, she did most of the tests. She didn't just design it. She was the only engineer that then went to the airfield and did all of her own test work herself. So she would, uh, I mean, this is diving down at 80 degrees near vertical at 350 miles an hour. Uh, and quite often pilots would lose consciousness because of the G-force, uh, you know, pushing the blood up into their head and her vision would red out. And she would often, well, she said she did sometimes lose consciousness herself, but managed to regain it in time to pull back on the stick and, um, you know, level out the nose of the plane and, and land safely. Um, so she was doing this incredibly important work for them. But as the war progressed, you know, Whereas Hannah would see bunting and parades and, you know, German glory and honour associated with the Third Reich that was promoting her. Melitta was, she was, she was much more of a critical, deeper thinker, and she saw people disappearing, you know, church members and liberal Democrats, as well as communists, just not disappearing from the streets. And she saw authority imposed by state-sanctioned violence. And she couldn't uh, she couldn't continue to support the regime as she worked out what was going on. But the reason she was conducting all her test work herself was that she knew she had to make herself invaluable to this regime. She had to be irreplaceable because in around 1935, when the Nuremberg laws came in, enshrining Nazi racial prejudice into uh, German law, Melissa discovered that her father had been born Jewish. And uh, he, he had converted as a teenager and she'd been brought up herself as a, a Christian. But that was of no uh, interest at all to the Nazis, of course. And so she applied for something called equal to Aryan status. And the work she did was designed to enable that to take place. But when she was offered it, she actually refused it unless all of her family were given that status. So in a way, she did a, a, a kind of agreement to try and save her family. But of course, by 1944, that, that wasn't enough for her. And um, she realised that she could no longer um, continue to support this regime or work for this regime. And so, I mean, I think the most extraordinary thing I found in my research was Melissa's handwritten 1944 diary. Oh it's just a date diary, but it's got everything written in. And uh, of course, if you know the name Stauffenberg at all, you're thinking of Klaus von Stauffenberg, um, who undertook the attempt on the 20th of July, the most famous assassination attempt on Hitler. And so I turned to uh, page 20th of July in this book, and she's involved. She's at the heart of the bomb plot. It's one of the most written about episodes of the Second World War, and yet I've never seen her name in connection with it. And it turned out that she was in the diary. It's kind of part coded and she's got nicknames for everyone in case it was discovered, of course. But with the help of her family and the German academic, we, we kind of went through it all. And uh, she's, she's meeting at conspiracy headquarters, Klaus von Stauffenberg, who was her brother-in-law's apartment in the weeks, the months, the weeks, and the days just before the attempt. She stays overnight there two days before, and it turns out that she had offered to fly the plane to take Klaus to the wolf's lair and bring him back again. Um, but unfortunately, in the end, she wasn't able to do that. Um, but she was right at the heart of it, and she'd been providing a safe space for the conspiracists to meet on a yacht on the Von Sea, because she had pilot's rights for, yes. you know, privileges. Um, so, and I couldn't understand why the story hadn't come out. Um, but it turned out that most of the men's papers had found their ways over time to the German military archive or the National Archive uh, in the Deutsche Museum or various places. But her papers were considered to be domestic and were just sent back to her family. So nobody had looked at them and there, there they were. Just How extraordinary. So she was married to Klaus's brother, is that right? His elder brother, Alexander, yes, who was okay. in Greece at the time of the bomb plot. She was arrested for various reasons which will let people discover but that wasn't really the end of the story tell us what happens no i thought i thought that that's what would happen I and mean, while she's in she was arrested immediately they rounded up all the Stauffenberg family members extended family and of course they um uh well they rounded up about two thousand other people as well just took it as an excuse to get rid of people um and she's put into prison and i thought well that would be the end of her story um and while she's there she hears of the execution of her two two of her brothers-in-law uh, and various other family members. So she's having this horrendous time. 
Um, amazingly, she still has her diary with her, but she manages to uh, persuade. She's got very high contacts and connections. You know, she knows Goering. She used to be friends with Udet. He's dead by now, though. Um, but she's got a lot of powerful connections. And she persuades them that she needs to continue her war work doing this development of planes. She's now working on night flying techniques and so on. And eventually she's let out. Um, and they say she has to immediately go from the prison to the airfield and continue her work. Um, but she doesn't. She has another extraordinary role in the war. And I don't want to spoil the whole book. Exactly. But, um, We're not going to give it away. She goes on. She goes on. One last question for me. So we have Hannah, fanatical yes. Nazi. We have Melita, part Jewish, secretly supporting famous attempt on Hitler. Is that, do either of them ever make reference to each other in any of their paperwork? In yes. In their diaries? Yeah, uh, not in diaries, um, and I don't have a diary for Hannah. She did write the memoirs after the war. Uh, I have um, Melissa's diary, but she doesn't refer to Hannah in it. But yes, there are there are lots of um, accounts from other people saying how, you know, because they were working at the same airfields and so on, but they wouldn't even stop to have a cup of tea together. Um, really? And there's one fantastic account by a man called Peter Riddell, who was actually... Um, uh, the world's uh, leading glider pilot before the war. He won the world records and he was friends with both of them. And on one day, he'd been the air attaché in Sweden. He, come, he gets recalled to Berlin and he doesn't want to get sent out in the Luftwaffe. So he's looking for a desk job. So he goes to his two female friends to see if they can get him work. He goes in the morning to Melitta. She can't help him, but they go for a sale on the Vonsi. They talk about various things. And that afternoon, he goes to Hannah's apartment in Berlin. And he says, oh, I've just come from Melitta. And Hannah is spitting tacks, just don't talk to me about that disgusting Jewish lesbian, um, basically. She uses different words, but that's what she's saying. And Peter Riddell is like, what are you talking about? Uh, and Hannah goes into this big story about how Melissa made a pass at her and all sorts of things. It's absolutely fascinating. So there's amazing documentary sources there. Just extraordinary. You have a copy of the book there, The Woman Who Flew for Hitler. I do. Would you mind giving us a brief reading so people get a, a foretaste of your writing and, um, oh. and of the story? Okay, so... Um, Very kind. Thank you, Claire. Pleasure. Um, so shall we do the bit from the preface? That would or... be lovely. Yes, yeah. please. Okay, just tell me when to stop. Sure. Um, so I start with a, a couple of quotes, but then we'll go straight into the text. Hannah Wright believed that she was an honest woman. Her American interrogator concluded his October 1945 report with the statement that her information had been given with sincere and conscientious effort to be truthful and exact. She claims that the only reason she remained alive is for the sake of truth, he added. Having died six months earlier, Melissa von Stauffenberg never got the equivalent opportunity to add her voice to the historical record. Her surviving sister, Clara, however, testified that Melissa would not have been capable of promoting anything uh, anything against her better knowledge. Yet it is unlikely that had Melissa been able to reflect on wartime events, the accounts of these two extraordinary women would have agreed. The only female test pilots actively to serve the Nazi regime, Hannah Reich and Melissa von Stauffenberg, were in many ways, oh, my pages are stuck together, were in many ways the mirror image of one another. One fair, fun, loud and irrepressible, the other dark, serious and considered. On the face of it, there were few obvious similarities between them. Yet both were great patriots with deeply held views on the importance of honour, duty and sacrifice. And both were to some extent misfits whose love of sensation, adrenaline and personal freedom drew them to defy all social expectations. Hannah and Melitta were born during the pioneering air age when it was hoped that flight would bring nations together. The First World War changed that giving pilots new roles in military reconnaissance and in combat, but the romance associated with flight persisted. Pilots prided themselves on their honour as well as their valour in the air, and aces, including the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, became legendary figures. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, a defeated Germany was forced to demobilise its air force and destroy its military aircraft. The manufacture of engine-powered planes was also tem temporarily forbidden, but gliders were exempt. As a result, in the years immediately after the war, gliding became the aspirational sport for the country's youth, symbolic not only of peace and freedom, but also of renewed national pride. Soon, crowds of thousands were gathering to watch displays and competitions. The Hirschberg Valley, where Melita went to boarding school and Hannah grew up, provided perfect conditions for gliding. 
As a result, both women learned to glide on above the same green slopes, shocking their friends by risking their necks in fragile open cockpit gliders made from wood and canvas. This was not behaviour expected of young German Frauleins in the 1920s and early 30s. What drove them was not just the adrenaline thrill of perilous flight, though that was a great lure for both women, but also the sense of freedom that gliding offered, taking them far away from the strictures and deprivations of Weimar Germany and providing an opportunity to align themselves with a heroic restoration of their country's honour. Fantastic. I think that will do nicely, Claire. Okay. Thank you so much. Beautifully read. Last question, really, for me, your fact, penultimate question. There is a thing with biographies, if you do not know your subjects, I've often found, not that I'm a biographer, but writing pieces about people who are gone, you often are left with a burning question that only they can answer. And I'm wondering, in the case of Hannah, um, if you could spend a minute with each of them, if there is an unanswered question that you would love to know the answer to that only they can provide. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a tricky question, isn't it? You're asking me for my weakness. Um, no, I'm not, actually. No, no, I must, no. It, no that's <laughs> not how I mean it, and you know it. <laughs> oh, I'd, love, I'd love to sit down with both of them. I mean, much more so with Melissa. I think Melissa is by far the more complex and interesting character yeah. as well. I mean, Hannah is almost pretty much there on the page. I mean, she writes her own book, and you could, clearly that has an agenda. She often presents the war the way she wants her stories to be told. Mm. Um, I guess I would be interested in the last days of Hitler in the in the bunker. And what she's most famous for is um, offering to fly him out. She she managed to come in under fire from the Red Army as uh, Berlin was surrounded. Got to the bunker, and she later flew out with last uh, orders. Uh, which she took to Donitz, and also last letters from the Goebbels. And she also, this is something I could ask her, she took out um, Eva Braun's last letter. Oh, and um, she didn't like Eva Braun. She could never really reconcile the fact. She didn't believe for a long time that Hitler had married her at the end. Um, she left just before they got married. And uh, she was so disgusted by Eva's letter, which she thought was very sycophantic, that she tore it up and threw it out. <laughs> so we don't actually have that bit of evidence. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask her about those last moments in the bunker, I guess. Um, for Melissa, I mean, there is so much more of interest there about her motivations, about her, her compromises. Um, I mean, clearly she was a deep German patriot, but her Germany wasn't the Germany of the Third Reich. It was an older, it was a Germany of Goethe and Faust and so on. So I'd like to ask her about her own crisis of conscience. Um, I'd like to ask her more about the details of the bomb plot. I mean, there's so much we could ask her. It'd be absolutely fascinating. It would be indeed. The, the, the final question is one you probably can't answer, but given the fantastic biographies you've created so far, can you give us any insights into who you've got your sights set on at the minute? Um, well, I have just submitted at the end of last week a proposal to my agent and she um, sent lots of complimentary words back. So fingers crossed that's just gone out to publishers at the moment. And uh, well, we'll have to see if I get commission, but there is another extraordinary untold woman story in there that gives rise to a new approach to some very important history, um, some big issues in there as well. So fingers crossed, I'm really hoping I get that commissioned. No clues on nationality, time period. No, nope, we'll see. We'll see what okay. happens. I shan't push you further. Um, thank you so much for coming to join us today, Claire. It's been such a pleasure to see you. Um, for those of you that are just catching up, Claire's three books are The Woman Who Saved the Children, The Story of Eglantine Jeb, The Spy Who Loved, Countess Christina Scarbeck, also known as Christine Granville, and most recently, of course, The Women Who Flew for Hitler, the incredible story of Hannah Reich and, of course, Melita von Stauffenberg. They are three fantastic works. Uh, and if you are very bored with lockdown and want to enter the lives of three, no, actually, four extraordinary women, of course, you'll find a Buy the Book button uh, below Claire's author page here on the Lockdown Lit Fest. Claire, thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, and everybody, thank you so much for coming to join us. Stay well, be safe, and look after yourselves. Cheerio. <laughs>